This video is from my course, AWS Step Functions Masterclass. If you're interested in learning more, check out the link in the description section below. Hello everyone, welcome back. In this section, we are gonna be talking about what are AWS Step Functions. This is gonna be an introductory lesson. We're just gonna cover the basics of Step Functions and talk about some of the features that the service offers. And first, I just want to give you a brief overview of the agenda of this lesson. So first of all, we're gonna talk about what Step Functions are. Then we're gonna jump into some of the different use cases that Step Functions solve for. We're going to briefly talk about why Step Functions are useful in terms of why people are so excited about using them and why they're so popular these days. Of course, nothing is perfect with any AWS service, so we do need to cover some of the disadvantages of using Step Functions. And then finally, I'm going to give you a brief overview of some of the different users of Step Functions, some different companies that use it, and the types of problems that they solve by leveraging them. So let's jump right into it. The first thing that I want to do is talk about what are AWS Step Functions. So Step Functions are a managed workflow or orchestration service with centralized state. And what that essentially means for you is that you can use Step Functions to create workflows that allow you to perform a sequence of tasks in a particular order and also include things like retries or conditional logic directly in your step function workflow. Now, it also has centralized state in the sense that the state of your workflow is persisted into the step function service. And by state, we mean where we are in the step function workflow. So which step are we on? What is the next step? What is the one that came before it? What are all the inputs and outputs? All of that is managed and saved for you by the step function service. Now, the really nice thing about using step functions in general is that you can create visually using the workflow studio or via infrastructure as code or IAC. Now we are going to use Workflow Studio quite a bit in this course. It is my recommended approach for anyone that's new to Step Functions to get familiar with the Workflow Studio. And the Workflow Studio is kind of like a design studio. So it's a drag and drop interface that's directly in the AWS console. It's a very intuitive tool to use. It makes a lot of sense, especially when you're getting started. Now, if you want to progress to infrastructure as code when you're a little bit more familiar, then by all means you can do so. And that's something we're gonna look at later in the course as well. Now, in terms of defining your workflow or deciding which steps to perform and in what order, you use flow constructs, which control the behavior of your workflow state machine. Now, there's a whole bunch of different flow constructs that include things like choice states, which are glorified if else blocks. Uh, there's a map state, which allows you to iterate over multiple different records, kind of like a for loop in any programming language. There's parallelism, so you can perform multiple tasks at once, and then once they're both done, you can join the result together. There's a whole bunch of different flow constructs that you can use to essentially define the flow of your step function workflow. Now, what makes step functions special over things like Apache Airflow is that you get direct integration with over 200 AWS services to perform tasks. And tasks are where you perform the bulk of the work in step functions. It allows you to call the variety of different AWS services and thousands of different APIs across those services without having to write a single line of code. So you can directly integrate with them. All you do is provide the input arguments and what you wanna do with the result, and that's all you need. So that's definitely one of the main selling points of using Step Functions, the rich integration with the AWS ecosystem. And now since Step Functions operate on top of the AWS network, they are of course distributed and reliable. Distributed in the sense that there's multiple different machines that are processing the tasks. This is all managed by the Step Functions service itself. And of course, in terms of reliability, if an availability zone goes down due to some natural disaster or some kind of weather incident, then instances in another availability zone will automatically start performing your work. So they're reliable in the sense that you're protected from infrastructure outages, and that is all handled by AWS for you. You don't have to lift a finger. Now, one of my favorite parts about using step functions is in terms of the comprehensive monitoring and debugging tools. You have access to some very, very comprehensive monitoring tools. You're able to inspect the state of step function workflows that are currently running, and even ones that have already completed in the past. You're able to see through an easy to use UI what the inputs and outputs are of each individual state, and then do a deep dive into your step function execution so you can understand exactly what happened for any workflow that ran. 
And this also plays into how we debug step function instances when something happens that's a little bit unexpected. So say for example, we call a dependencies API, it returns something that's a little bit unexpected. All of that information is saved in an audit trail so you can take a look at it later and debug the issue. So very, very helpful from a monitoring and debugging perspective. All right, so that covers what step functions are. Let's move on now to why step functions are useful and some of the different use cases that they apply to. So the first one that I wanna talk about is microservice coordination. So maybe you have a API where you need to perform a sequence of tasks in a particular order. So maybe you wanna fetch some data here, process it there, grab some data from somewhere else, enrich the data. This is a great use case to use step functions. And a prime example of this pattern in action was at reInvent for the past couple of years. Some of you may know about it, and it's the serverless Espresso. And for those of you that don't, uh, what the folks at AWS did, these are folks that work at AWS, they created an automated espresso vendor or a coffee vendor that is backed by AWS step functions. And so the tool had a nice little kiosk or a nice little UI in front of it, and you can essentially order what you wanted. And behind the scenes, this was all backed by a step function workflow that was triggered by an API, and it triggered some mechanical parts in the shop to prepare and serve your espresso. So great for API or microservice coordination, or even optionally larger scale workflows that need to perform multiple sequences of tasks in particular orders in a robust and reliable way. Now it's also useful in other contexts in terms of large scale data processing. So for ETL jobs or processing hundreds of thousands, if not millions of records, the step function service just released some more features that allow you to scale up to process tens of thousands of records at the same time. And you can potentially perform jobs that uh, process millions or even billions of records. There's really no limit except for what your inputs are. Uh, so that's another prime use case for using step functions. Now, another use case where I've seen step functions used a lot is for data preparation and coordinating the training of machine learning models. Uh, so if you need to grab some data from particular spots, maybe enrich it, maybe aggregate it, maybe process it in a certain way, and then trigger something like an AWS SageMaker endpoint, this is another great use case to use AWS step functions. Now, this just scratches the surface of what is possible. Of course, there are many, many more different use cases, and the limit is really just what you can come up with. So there's tons of stuff that you can do with it. And once you see step functions in action, I'm sure you're going to be inspired with many, many more ideas. Okay, so what I wanna briefly do now is talk about some of those different constructs and then just give you a sneak peek of what a step function looks like. So let's do that now. All right, so some of the different features that you could perform. So of course there's chaining, so you could perform sequences of tasks. You wanna do one thing, then the next thing, then the next thing. And then potentially if there's an error in one case, you can fall back to some kind of plan B. There's, of course, if else statements, which are called choice blocks. So you can say if one thing occurs, um, do this. If something else occurs, do that. And this is based on input data. So the values of your data as they are flowing through your step function states. Another really powerful feature is human interaction or pausing your workflow until a human performs some kind of task and then calling back into your step function to resume it. For example, say you have some kind of, I don't know, fraud detection service that flags orders when they look potentially malicious or not up to snuff. Uh, you can flag those orders, pause that process, send an email to a customer service agent, have the person review it. If they approve, then they can resume the step function. And if they determine it's fraud, they can cancel the step function execution. Uh, this is another really, really powerful feature and step functions make it really easy to set this up. And then finally, there's parallelism. So doing a bunch of things at once, uh, multiple different things, and then joining the results to one output, another really powerful feature in terms of concurrency. So you'll see this a lot in a bunch of different step function workflows. So in terms of an example of what a step function definition actually looks like, you're probably wondering at this point. Uh, so let me show you one. And this is actually the step function flow that we're going to be creating in the practice lab as part of this course. So this is a order processing workflow. So it's starts at the top. And by the way, this was created entirely in Workflow Studio using the drag and drop interface. You can see it looks really pretty. And once you have a, a knack for how step functions work, it'll be very easy to understand. But let me just walk you through it really quick. Um, so it's our order processing flow. So we're starting at the top. We have a parallel states. We want to do two things in sequence. We want to verify the payment details of the order. We also want to fetch the stock levels of our order. If either of these calls fail, then we want to immediately abort the step function. 
Now, once we have the stock levels and we verify the payment details, assuming both of these were a success, we move on to verifying that all items in the order have a stock level that's greater than one. I'm not sure if you can see it here, but that's what happens here. So we're using a map state, which is essentially a for loop. Then we have a choice state to say that if the quantity of stock for each item is greater than one, then we go to our next step. And if it's not, then we fail the step function itself. Now, assuming this all works successfully, then we move on to this level left branch. If it doesn't succeed, then we move to the fail state. In other words, that there's an item in our order that has a stock of zero. So that's a reason for us to fail the step function at this point. And then we're integrating with some AWS services here. So we're going to save the order entry to DynamoDB. We're going to charge the customer. If we fail to charge the customer, then we're going to set the payment failed state on our DynamoDB table. And if we succeed, we're going to go this way to say payment is processed. And then we're going to broadcast that notification to interested parties. So this is an example of using step functions to create a pretty complicated workflow here. And this is exactly what we're going to be building later in the course as part of that practice lab. So look forward to it later on. All right. So I hope that gave you a good overview of what's in store with step functions and some of the different features and benefits of using them. Now let's talk about why step functions are useful. Why are people talking about step functions? Why are they so beneficial? And why are they such an attractive option and kind of changing the game in terms of how we build serverless applications. So using step functions, it simplifies your implementation by writing workflows instead of codes. So traditionally, we would write code to represent a sequence of tasks. You know, you would write do step A, do step B. If step B fails, then do C, and then, you know, a sequence of other things that could potentially ensue. Uh, so this gets really hairy and really complicated. And the nice thing about using step functions is that it's a drag and drop interface. You can drag all of this stuff directly in the studio editor. You can validate it, you can test it. It's very, very simple and intuitive to use. Now, one of my other benefits or one of the real reasons that I love using step functions is that it's really easy to understand when shifting contexts. So consider a case where maybe you're on a team that owns a couple different software packages or a couple different services that do a variety of different things. If you're not regularly looking at the code for those different services, then you're very quickly going to be out of date and you're going to forget how things work in order to understand it. You're going to have to dive into it, read all the code again. Hopefully you made some notes. And if you didn't, then you're going to spend quite a bit of time. Now with step functions, everything is visual. So it's very easy to see how it works. And just by glancing at a step function workflow in the studio, you can very quickly understand the logic of your workflow and then make changes that are hopefully a lot faster compared to writing code. Now, in addition, something that we kind of touched on, but I think it's worth re-mentioning, which is that you can build a lot faster using the Workflow Studio. Having this drag and drop interface at your disposal makes things really, really convenient. You also get very easy integration with other AWS services, over 200 and thousands of different APIs that are at your disposal. As well, it's completely serverless, so there's no infrastructure to manage. You don't have to host you know, a Lambda function or an EC2 instance or a Kubernetes cluster, anything like that. It's all hidden for you behind the AWS service, so they manage all of that stuff um, on your behalf. In addition to that, there are built-in resiliency features like error handling and retry logic. So as you kind of saw in that image of our order processing workflow, if there's an error in certain cases, we can take a certain path. Now, in my example, I just failed the step function. But in a more thorough example, maybe you want to perform a different sequence of tasks. So if the item isn't in stock, maybe you want to email the customer and do something else. So you can add some pretty comprehensive error handling that takes certain certain paths based on your business requirements. And then as well, there is some pretty robust retry logic that's built into step functions. So with just a couple configuration updates and adding and changing a couple values, you can do things like add retries. So you can say, you know, if we fail to call this API, then pause the step function, try again in 10 seconds or something like that. So it adds resiliency into how your step function operates. And this makes it much more simple to build robust and fault tolerant applications. And then, of course, we have all those monitoring and debugging features that help you track the state and diagnose problems. We talked about that briefly, but it's a very, very helpful feature and it doesn't cost you a dime. This is in contrast to, you know, if you had a application that you were building hosted on EC2 machines in order to understand what happened in a failure, you'd have to dive into the logs, which can be time consuming and could be very difficult. If you don't have any background on how the service is built, maybe you're a DevOps person, you won't 
know what you're looking at. But if you're just looking at a visual that tells you kind of how your workflow is built, what state it's on, where it failed at, then obviously that's going to be a lot easier for you to grasp. So that's another key benefit of using step functions. All right, so that's a little bit about why step functions are useful. Now, not everything is rosy about step functions. Of course, step functions are a tool, and like any tool, there's a right time and there's a wrong time. So what are the disadvantages of using step functions? What should you be careful of if you are considering using them? So let's talk about that now. So disadvantages. The first one is that there's a pretty comprehensive learning overhead, which is, I imagine, why you're taking this course. Maybe you're interested in learning them, or maybe you have some knowledge of them already and you're just trying to build a more thorough understanding. They are very useful, of course, but you do have to spend some time understanding the details, especially if you're going to operate them at scale in a production environment. The second disadvantage of using step functions when compared to something like hosting your infrastructure yourself in an API is the cost. So step functions have a couple different payment modes and it depends on the type that you're using, the standard or express. But for standard, you pay on the number of state transitions. For express, you pay on the duration, the memory and things like that. But they do cost money and they are on the more expensive side of the AWS services that are available to you. Um, so you need to be aware of what that means for you and if your company is willing to shell out the cost. And this warrants some more critical thinking of whether step functions are right for your use case, which is a topic for a later lesson in this course. Another disadvantage of using step functions is kind of a pro, but you can look at it through the disadvantage lens as well, is that the state is now centralized and the state is centralized with the team that owns the step function workflow. So if you are in a large company that operates using something like a service-oriented architecture, architecture where you all own different components of a general flow. If you choose to use step functions, the state of these different components will now be embedded in a single workflow. And the question becomes, who now owns this workflow? Is it one particular team? Is it a combination of teams? If it's different teams, you have to figure out how to work together to modify and update the step function safely. So that is a concern that needs to be addressed and thought through when you are thinking of using step functions. And that's a perfect segue into my next slide here, which is who uses step functions. So what are the different companies, organizations, use cases that people use it for? Uh, so the first one is Coinbase. This is a Bitcoin slash uh, cryptocurrency. As you can tell, I don't know a lot about uh, cryptocurrency, but they use step functions for deployment orchestration to process and deploy uh, dozens of serverless applications at once that all operate as a unit. So they use that to coordinate the deployment for all of them. And then there is Yelp, which uses step functions for subscription billing to make it more resilient and leverage built-in retry handling in case things occur like, you know, there's a failure when processing the payment request, things like that. And then there's the popular media company, Thomson Reuters. They use step functions for video encoding and processing news clips that they show on their website into a variety of different formats. Uh, then there's the popular beverage brand, Coca-Cola, and they used step functions in a particular use case to update nutritional labels across a variety of products all in one shot. This made it a lot easier instead of having to do them independently. So very useful for coordinating that update. And then of course, um, no surprise here, here, there's Amazon or AWS. Uh, some of you probably already know that I work at Amazon. I'm a senior software engineer there. And I can tell you firsthand that step functions are growing in popularity. They are becoming extensively used across a wide variety of different problem areas. And this is not just in my area, but this is in other parts of the company as well. It seems like there's really kind of a, a land rush towards using step functions instead of trying to create workflows in a more kind of less intuitive way. So that is it for this lesson. In the next one, we're going to look at a more concrete example where we take a look at a business problem and then compare a single program process versus using Lambda, SQS, and SNS. So this will answer the question, when should I use one of these approaches or the other? I'll see you in the next one.